thrilled that you're here. Um, my name is Scott Hess. I'm currently the president of the council, and we're really thrilled and uh, happy that you enjoyed a meal and will hopefully have an interesting and enriching um, program for you this evening. The, um, the, bath, uh, the, the technical things, the bathrooms are downstairs when you first come in City Hall. There's also some bathrooms on the main, uh, on, the, on the lower level in the entrance in the back, and there's exits to my left and fire entrance where, where you came in, just in case there's an emergency. So we got that out of the way. Um, raffle tickets, uh, fill out your raffle tickets. You can fill them out and put them in the boxes until 7.15, and then we're probably going to be drawing the raffles at uh, 7.45. So get those in. <clears throat> you can um, fill out. You, we still have the elections. You can. Uh, you can um, you can vote in the corner for the elections. Although we only have, we have five contestants for the five positions, uh, the top three vote getters will get the three year um, terms and the others will get one and two year terms. So please vote and you can also vote online um, until 8 p.m. this evening. So the more we get, the, it's just nice to see uh, a nice turnout for voting. On your table also you have um, some comment cards. If you have any comments um, about the co-op, please fill them out and we will respond. Uh, staff and management will respond to the, um, to the comments or questions that you have. So we encourage you to fill one of them out um, and please hand them in to uh, bring them up to us or one of the staff people. So thank you very much. <clears throat> and I think... We're ready to go. Oh, uh, I want to announce the, uh, the, our council members. We've got Katie Michaels here, <clears throat> Mark Simikowski, uh, Eric Jacobson, Eva Shackman right here, <laughs> and Steve Farnham. And we've got a couple of members, Ashley Hill and um, Pat. Pat is not here either. Pat uh, Sergi is not here. And Shannon Leslie. They weren't able to make it tonight. And we also have um, special this year. We're really excited that we're going to be having two staff members that will be on the council this year. So we really feel that's going to be a great addition. Yes, we are very, very excited about that. Olivia Dunton and Andrew Sullivan will be joining um, the council. So I think it's going to be a great addition and add some richness to the council for the year going forward. I agree. And I would like to, uh, our facilitate, facilitator for the evening is Stephanie Lafer, so take it away. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm Stephanie Lehar, and I'm a member owner and an occasional planning consultant and moderator to the co-op, so I'm glad you're here. And my job is to help everyone share airtime with a very full and rich agenda. So um, we'll have some time to get information and hear a local food panel and all sorts of things. In fact, here's our agenda right now. Um, we will start by um, establishing, actually I'll, I'll establish the quorum before we get going. Uh, I'll introduce the agenda without feedback. and. Uh, We'll start by establishing a quorum, and I need to look around and find out who has the count. Close to 200, we've got it, okay. And um, then we also have minutes to approve from 2018. Scott, do I turn this over to you to take the motion or? Okay. At an angle. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you very much, Jay. And do I have a second? Second to approve the minutes? Okay. Sandal, Sandal Kate is seconds the uh, motion. All those in favor of accepting the minutes from the annual meeting of 2018, please signify by saying yes. yes. Any opposed? Any abstentions? It passes, thank you. It was Jay. Jay made the motion. 
All right. So the rest of our agenda, we've already succeeded in doing number one. Um, we'll, we'll hear some um, recognition for employees that have been working at the co-op a long time. And we have a real treat. We have a local producer panel of three women who own or work in wonderful family-owned food businesses who, who supply the co-op. And uh, we'll have the Hunger Mountain Cooperative Community Fund Grant Awards reports about the business and uh, a Hunger Mountain Cooperative Community Award. We'll have a question and answer period for all of you. And we also have some people watching uh, on ORCA Media and submitting comments online. Uh, and that's it. And a reminder that you have to be present to win the raffles. And you can enter throughout the evening over there. And these comment cards, if you don't get a chance to speak during the public comment period or you have other thoughts or comments that occur to you along the way. So at this point, I'm going to introduce Jess Knapp, the staff rep to the council for the Employee Appreciation Awards. Each year we, sorry, this is a weird microphone. <laughs> Each year we celebrate one person who gets recognized by the employees for their excellence in customer service. This year, this employee was Alex Fontaine. He works in the, <laughs> the food service department. <laughs> Congratulations, Alex. If you're here, stand up. Nope. <laughs> Next, we want to celebrate people or employees who have been here for 20 years of service or more. Would I call your name if you're here? Could you stand up? We're also going to have a plate, which Kari has right there. We're going to give that to all of these employees for their service. So we have Robert Kiergan. Celebrating 34 years. He's our produce manager. <laughs> Mary Wells, at 29 years, she's our bookkeeper. <laughs> Mary Trafton, celebrating 23 years, she's our graphic artist. And Ben Bashore, selling very 21 years. He's our maintenance coordinator. Pat Luce, also celebrating 21 years. He's our beer and wine buyer. And Giles Brule, celebrating 20 years. He's our IT system admin. Nancy McShane, celebrating 20 years. She's a supervisor in the prepared foods department. And Rebecca Grick, celebrating 20 years. She works in the produce department. Thank you for your service. These are only a few of our employees who spend their time and dedication and hard work doing what they do to make the co-op happen. All the staff, could you please stand up and have, can we have a round of applause for them? And I, I apologize to Julia Goldstein. She's going to be joining, our, joining the council. Um, I totally admitted her name, but we're very excited for her to join us also. So thank you, Julia. OK, I'd like to invite our panelists for the local foods panel to come up to the front of the room to this table. Claire, great. And uh, Christine and Emily, who. Wonderful. 
And I'm going to have Eva Schechtman from the Council introduce the panelists. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, uh, Christine, are you here? Does anyone know Christine Lazora? I'd love for her to come up to the front. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Well, we're going to go ahead, and if she can join us, that's great. So, um, let me introduce Emily Von Trapp. Emily is the third generation to cultivate the land where she is a flower farmer growing year-round blooms for the community of Central Vermont. She specializes in winter-grown tulips, fragrant lilies, dahlias, and many annual and perennial blooms grown in Wade's Field. Emily first began selling her blooms to the Hunger Mountain Co-op when she was 17 years old, a beautiful partnership that is now 23 plus years in the making. As a vendor of the co-op, Emily values what the co-op stands for and the important role it plays as a cornerstone of our community, which is why it is also important to her to be a supporting co-op member. Please welcome Emily Von Trapp. Um, Claire Wheeler, I'm sorry, uh, excuse me. My, um, somewhere in my brain, uh, my apologies, Claire George. I knew something was going to happen. Okay, Claire George started Butterfly Bakery of Vermont in 2003 after leaving as baker at the Hunger Mountain Co-op. Her bakery specializes in Vermont maple sweetened, sweetened baked goods, but now Butterfly Bakery of Vermont makes more hot sauce than baked goods using 100% Vermont grown chili peppers. Please welcome Claire George. I don't know if Christine will come or not, but I'm going to uh, start us off by asking the two of you some questions and we'll We'll have a conversation about those, and we'll use uh, maybe half our time on questions and stories, and then we'll open it up to questions from the rest of you for Emily and Claire and Christine, if she is able to make it. So I'm going to start with you, Claire. I wondered if you could just tell us your story briefly and how you came to own and operate Butterfly Bakery. Sure. Um Stand up. Does it work for you to stand up? Sure. Sure. <laughs> How's it? Is this better? Because we don't have a raised um, platform. Great. Uh, yeah. So I um, I was a computer science major in college. Um, didn't want to go into that industry. It was right when the tech bubble burst, and so I moved to Vermont. I wanted to start my own food business, didn't know really how to, how to do it, so I got a job at Hunger Mountain Co-op to give myself a little experience. Um, and uh, after, I was at Hunger Mountain Co-op for about a year and a half after I left there, started my bakery um, doing vegan whole grain baked goods, which we continue to do. But about five years ago, we started making hot sauce, um, and that has 60 plus percent of our business now. We're the number one purchaser of Vermont grown chili peppers in the world. Um, we actually bought uh, th about 35,000 pounds of Vermont chili grown chili peppers this year. So that was fun. <laughs> it was fun to process and freeze them. Um, so we also, besides making hot sauce, we, um, we've actually started co-packing. We make other people's products for them as well. Um, and what's really cool is our, co our customers, our clients, are all around the country. So we're actually able to use Vermont ingredients in products that we make for California companies, um, which, is, which is really cool because a lot of these clients of ours don't know how to source sustainable um, kind of quality agriculture. Given left to their own devices, they might just buy um, 
they might buy whatever they can from at the cheapest price from the nearest distributor. Um, we can actually connect them with a farmer, connect them with a farm, um, and and put some really good ingredients in there. And it's really cool to be able to do that. Uh, so that's what we're doing now. <laughs> Great, thanks. Emily, tell us about your story and how you started Von Trapp Flowers. Sure. Um, so I grew up in Waitsfield, Vermont, and um, was surrounded by... Sorry. <laughs> I was surrounded by my parents' gardens um, from a small child and growing up, and I was always fascinated with the magic and the wonder of uh, flowers starting from a tiny seed and with the right nurturing and love, what it can turn into. And um, I'm kind of just a nurturer by nature, so I really got into growing flowers when I was about 12 and um, started selling my first bouquets at a farmer's market, then started selling to a local grocery store in Waitsfield called Mahiran's Market. Um, and then when I was 17, I pulled into the co-op parking lot with uh, the back of my Subaru loaded with flowers and met um, Robert Kerrigan for the first time. And uh, Rowan was still at the co-op at that point, so the two of them took a peek at my flowers and immediately said they'd start selling them. Um, and so that was 23 years ago, which seems crazy. Um, and so from that point on, um, I was only 17, so I went off to college and decided I was going to pursue education, which I did for um, 16 years. And I could never let go of my flower growing bug. It just kind of consumed me. So I would each summer come back and grow my flowers um, and sell them to the markets. And then um, I had my daughter 13 years ago, and I was always juggling the trying to keep my career going as an educator, but also keeping my dream of being a flower farmer alive. And um, I realized in order to do that, I needed to find a way to grow year-round blooms um, because supporting yourself on just one or two seasons uh, as a flower farmer is really hard to do in a zone four state like Vermont. Um, <laughs> we don't have the longest growing season. So I started to try to find ways to be creative and add new crops um, to what I was already growing. And um, I had a really strong interest in growing tulips and finding a way to force them in winter so that I could be bringing flowers to the co-op and to the other markets, not just from June through the end of September, but you know, could I make it so that I had blooms almost year round? Um, so 10 years into my tulip forcing, I now am plant, planting, in the middle of planting 80,000 tulip bulbs. Um, and I've figured out some ways creatively um, with season extension to have them start as early as mid-January, and then last year they went until the end of June, so I had a 150-day-long tulip season. Um, and I do that by incorporating some interesting ways of season extension. I create something I call a snow bunker, and I really try to be as low impact as possible in my farming. Um, and so basically I reuse materials that I have on the farm to create a structure and I backfill that structure with snow, and so essentially it's like a tulip igloo, or you know, all natural walk in cooler where I'm just using what's available to me in the environment so there's not extra fuel or electricity going in because um, I want to be as low impact as possible. Um, but so I'm kind of rambling on here. That's how I got started. I love what I do. I love being able to provide um, Central Vermont with fresh local flowers year round. It brings me Lots and lots of joy, and I love the support of the co-op and people who buy my flowers. So, thanks. So let's, I, I'd love to ask you a couple more questions and then bring it to everybody to ask questions. What's one of the more interesting or surprising things you've learned about being in business? And I'll switch to you, Claire, because it's not always a straight line. You start with a plan, right? Yeah, it's, um, it's definitely not a straight line. Uh, <laughs> um, so in the last five years since we started doing hot sauce, we've grown a lot. Um, I spent a long time basically doing 
the, the same thing day in, day out. It's, and as a baker, it's what I enjoy doing. Um, I get great pleasure with doing the same thing day in, day out. Um, but all of a sudden, it's we're not doing the same thing day in, day out. And um, learning to grow as a business has been really interesting because uh, the, we're about six times the size that we were just three years ago. Um, and, and so learning what that means as a business here in Vermont while being really committed to staying true to being a small business. I mean, even if we ever become a big business, we want to stay a small business. Um, we use our hands in things all the time. Um, and it's, it's been very, um, it's, I don't know, it's, it's a good, it's a learning experience every day. Um, so, you know, we're doing all this, this co-packing. Co-packing can be a really, uh, mechanized business you can do the same thing over and over and over again and we're really committed to like I said being a small business so our our niche is custom co-packing um, and we really bring our our hands into um, making other people's making other people's products be you know in I don't know I can't think of the right way to say put it but it's um, it's been really it's been an eye-opening lesson to learn how to make other people's products and how to make them in the most efficient way possible that we can all make money and you know build our businesses, um, but also not to lose the humanity in it. Um, and that's been a really important part for us, and it's been a really great daily lesson. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Something interesting or surprising you've learned about being from being in this business, Emily? Um, I think just how much the weather <laughs> impacts farming of any kind um, and needing to be able to think on your feet and be creative in how you respond to and prepare for the weather. Like today, getting ready to tuck more tulips in and it starts snowing and I know all my tulip crates that are pre-filled with soil that I have to plant are going to freeze and my bulbs haven't gotten here yet. So trying to figure out how to adjust with what's happening with the weather is a, a big challenge, but one that I really embrace. Um, and then just the, you know, trying to make sure that I have things scheduled out the way they're supposed to be. Um, I do a lot of successive plantings. So over the summer months, every um, week, I'm planting a new crop of lilies and trying to make sure that I'm timing that so that I don't have a glut of flowers that I can't move. Um, so just trying to figure out and juggle all of that. And I think also um, it's been really wonderful to kind of feel out the flower season year round and um, kind of surprisingly to me, I, I don't know why it surprised me, but people are desperate for flowers in the middle of winter, just <laughs> like I am. Um, and it's been really amazing to see how many more flowers I can sell at that time of year. Um, it really has become like the foundation of my flower sales is my winter sales. Um, and so how much people really want and need color at that time. And it totally makes sense to me, but it I think the first couple of years that I was realizing that it was a little, you know, pleasantly surprising to see how much people want flowers during that time of year. Great, I do. <laughs> so the last question from me is: I wondered if you could each give us a little of the inside scoop about what it's like working with Vermont co-ops and with Hunger Mountain Co-op in particular, because I don't think we always think about what it's like for our producers to work with our co-op business. Uh, so Hunger Mountain Co-op was my first customer in Vermont since I was working there before I left to start my own business. Um, and there is absolutely no way that I could have ever gotten a start without uh, stores like the co-op and other independent stores in Vermont. We are incredibly lucky to have this uh, incredible abundance of independent stores here in Vermont. Um, so many places, uh, so many, so many places just just have chain stores or just have Walmart, and the barrier to entry into those stores is enormous. Um, the the regulations you have to pass, the um, the rules that you have to follow, you have to sell through a distributor, you have to use a co-packer like me. Um, <laughs> but it, um, it it's 
it's difficult for stores like the co-op to deal with how, all us small little businesses. Um, you know, there's more orders to place. There's more, there's more um, orders to receive. We make more mistakes as we're learning. Um, and it's, it's incredible that they're willing to spend the time and the money. I mean, at Hunger Mountain Co-op, I don't know if they still do it, but w I know when I was starting out, would print my UPC codes for me. I did. <laughs> um, the, the little barcode on the back is actually really expensive. It's a really expensive thing to put on your packaging. And, um, and Hunger Mountain Co-op and, and other stores like them will actually print them for you if you're a small business and can't afford to, to or don't. It doesn't make sense for you to put a barcode on your packaging. Um, and that's, that, that's amazing. You know, Walmart's not going to print your barcode for you. <laughs> um, so it's, I'm immensely grateful, even though um, we are dealing with all different kinds of customers now, it, or all different kinds of stores, um, I'm incredibly grateful to the small, to the independent stores and the co-ops around here. And they're still who I seek out. If I'm, even if I'm going outside of Vermont, the companies that I reach out to, I still reach out to the independent stores. I, I actually have a lot of... Um, I don't, I'm not, I don't object to selling to the chains, but I, I kind of make them approach me because they, they're hard to deal with if I have to approach them. <laughs> so it's, uh, I'm incredibly grateful. Thank you. Um, so I, I feel just super grateful to be able to be a vendor and a member of the Hunger Mountain Co-op um, for the 23 years that I've been selling there. Um, there's been a lot of flexibility and an understanding when maybe a crop fails or I don't have something that the support is there from the co-op and that no matter what I have or when I have it to bring it in and they're willing to sell it. So there's just been a tremendous amount of support and I think it was really important for me starting out you know, as a teenager um, with this venture to have a store that so clearly valued my product and supported me and believed in me, I think it really kind of helped me have the momentum to keep moving forward. Um, and I now sell to, at this point I'm selling to 10 stores throughout central Vermont, but um, my heart is really at the co-op and Mahirans where I first started out, so they're my priority and I always make sure to have as many flowers there as I can possibly have. Um, I really value that the co-op values local um, farmers and locally grown things. That's, it's, it's really important for us small farmers. Um, if we didn't have places like the co-op that valued that, it would be really hard to make ends meet. So um, that emphasis is really important. And as a member, the fact that I can go to a store and buy all organic produce is really important to me. Um, so. I think all those things make it uh, a really special relationship. And um, like she was saying, that having independent stores um, who support local Vermont products is, it's really important, especially in this day and age with all the chains kind of taking over. So. Why don't you hang on? Are you ready for some general sure. questions? Okay, I'm gonna get the other mic. Um, what would you like to know from Emily and Claire, these founder owners who are co-op vendors. Sandal. If, if it doesn't work, I can repeat the question. I think it's on. Try, try just, no? Oh. Um, I have a, my name is Sandal Kate. I have a question for Claire. I think I remember you starting out on Berry Street. Is that right? Uh, so actually, Berry Street was our third home. We actually started renting the um, coffee corner in the middle of the night. Uh, that's where uh. we did our baking uh, right after I left the co-op. Then we rented out um, Patrick Giantonio's kitchen. He makes the Patrick's pretzels, the twist, Patrick's twisters. Uh, we rented his kitchen for a couple years. And then uh, when we finally got a, a space on Berry Street, that, was, that, that place holds a very dear spot in my heart because that was I, our first home. <laughs> I remember finding you because on the same platform, which is behind where Fisher Auto is, whatever, um, and the bike place is there now. Um, I had to go to the vacuum cleaner store, yes. which was next door. But it was much more interesting to me that you were there. <laughs> so I have a question just about 
how difficult or easy was it for you to expand and where do you do more of your production now if that's something you can make public? Yeah, no, it's um, expanding is difficult. Um, so uh, on Berry Street, we had 450 square feet. Um, it was a really tiny little space. Uh, when we started doing the hot sauce, we started renting out space at the Food Venture Center out in Hardwick. Uh, and that has been that was unbelievable. We grew an enormous amount, way more than I ever expected in, in the span of about a year we rented the space there. And um, I wish there were a food venture center for companies my size um, because we are, we have, we're at 3,000 square feet now and we are desperately out of space. Um, we are, one of our, we have, we, up until about a month ago, we had two 40 gallon steam kettles. One of them just broke, um, so we've, fortunately been able to replace it with an 80 gallon steam kettle um, but we're making between three and five thousand bottles of hot sauce a week um, and we need more space all the time and I'm trying to figure out how to do that we we would like to move into our forever we don't moving is really expensive and difficult and I would love to move into like a 15,000 square foot space but um, we can't afford that yet so we're just trying to make it work where we can until we can afford to grow um, I'm not willing to take an investor so that makes it a little bit more difficult but yeah that's what we're doing <laughs> all right thanks other questions I'm going to come over and I'm going to let you use my mic. Hi. This one is for Emily. Emily, transporting all those flowers must be a big job and take a lot of time and how do you do you have employees? And how do you how do you do it all and also your daughter? How does she fit into your life? Um it's <laughs> I I call it uh, struggling and juggling. Um, it is, it does take a lot of time and um, I actually resigned from my teaching job this past spring. So this current year, I'm totally dedicated to my flowers. Um, I do do the majority of my deliveries every once in a while. Um, my mom or dad will chime in and help out um, with that. When my daughter was little, um, and up until just a couple years ago, she always came on every delivery with me. She's always there right near me when I'm um, either out in the field working or arranging flowers. Um, so she's very much my little sidekick. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a real juggle until this year. Um, when I was teaching, I would get my daughter up in the morning and we'd go to school. And then when she was done school, we'd go to the greenhouse and I'd harvest like mad and we'd go home and I'd make dinner and I'd give her her bath and put her to bed and then I'd go back to the greenhouse till midnight or one in the morning or until my mom came down and said, you have to turn the light off in the greenhouse, I can't sleep. So, so it's, been, um, it's been a journey, but I'm really passionate about it and all the hard work that I put into it for the first 12 years of my daughter's life has made it so that now I don't rely on needing to teach in addition to being a flower farmer. And um, that's a really great place to arrive at for me to just say that I'm a full-time year-round flower farmer here in Vermont, so. <laughs> well, other questions? Yes. Go for it. Okay, I'll go for it. Uh, have you ever, either for one of you, a uh, little bit different questions, but uh, tried to uh, change the recipes of the hot sauce or innovate there or change the, the, the bulbs that you grow or, um, or, or increase the variety? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm always trying new annuals, perennials, new bulbs. Um, last year I did 65 different varieties of tulips. This year I'm doing 75 different varieties. Uh, Ten years ago I started out with 3,000 bulbs. This year I'm planting 80,000 bulbs. So I'm constantly changing, looking for new varieties to trial um, and increasing production. 
Um, yeah, trying out new things is what we do constantly. Um, my specialty is actually in recipe development and product development. So I help out. Um, we do our own product development and recipe development, which you know shows up in new products. And, oh, even more. Okay. <laughs> and um, and then we have, uh, and then we also develop products for other people. So. Um, there's a hot sauce tasting room down in Brooklyn called The Heatnist, and they're the ones who um, supply the hot sauce for a show called Hot Ones, um, which we've had a hot sauce on, which is really cool. Um, but we develop products in conjunction with them for, um, for usually collaboration sauces. We do uh, uh, independent products, and then we also do non-hot sauce baking um, recipe development as well. We're working on a, a cookie recipe for a company out of the Midwest right now. Um, we're working on another cookie. Well, and then and then we, with co-packing, it's interesting because sometimes you can talk about things and sometimes you can't. And so I need to be careful about what I can talk about. Um, but then there's even products locally that we've helped develop that Interestingly, we can't talk about because that's the agreement that we made with the uh, with the person. But in products actually that are sold at Hunger Mountain Co-op that we help develop, which is really fun. Great. Others? I'm just going to butt in real quick. Yes. Doug, Chef Doug and his crew are getting ready to leave. If we can have a round of applause for the wonderful meal. <laughs> Doug, Doug, thank, Doug, thank you so much. I'm looking around to see if there are other questions for our business founder owners at the front of the room. Okay, I wonder if I could ask you a closing question then as you know, we're so it's so happy to see you succeed in your small businesses and not so small businesses anymore. And I wondered from where you sit, what gives you hope? for the Vermont farm and food system. Start with Emily, you have the mic. Um, I think what gives me hope is just the, especially now, sorry. <laughs> I'm really scared of microphones, I don't know why. Um, I think what gives me hope is uh, the the local movement, which obviously in Vermont, it's it's we're rooted in it, you know, it's very much a part of our philosophy, but, I'm really seeing over the last couple of years how much more people are valuing um, locally grown flowers versus flowers that are flown in and the impact that flying flowers in has on our environment um, and you know the pesticides that are used from on things that are flown in. So the hope is people really appreciating and valuing local ecologically grown blooms um, and where that's going for me in my business. So. Um, I have an incredible amount of hope in our, in our local food system. Um, I remember when I moved to Vermont in 2002, there was kind of an attitude of like, oh, you, to get good food, you have to go to New York or to Boston. And, and then that kind of slowly changed into, okay, we have good ingredients here, but you know, we don't really have the restaurants. You, know, you still have to go to the big cities for the good restaurants. And now we have amazing restaurants and we have amazing ingredients and people, it's so weird to me when I travel outside of Vermont and I see Vermont farms on the menus. Um, and I'm like, oh yeah, I know, I know Beth. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> and, um, and, and it's, and I feel like it's just keep growing. It just keeps growing. And I feel like people are recognizing it. I feel like it's, it's good at every step along the way. It's good for our communities. It's good for our, our bellies. It's good for um, our, our soil. It's good for our souls. And, and I feel like people are recognizing it. I feel like it's just getting better. Wonderful. Well, let's have a hand for Emily and Claire. Thank you so much. I'm really carried the panel as a duo. Okay. So I'm looking around for Matt Levin now. There you are. It's time for you to come up um, and tell us about the Hunger Mountain Cooperative Community Fund Grants. We're a little ahead. I hope nobody minds if we get out a little early and have more time for community conversation. Is that okay? All right. Go ahead. Uh, good evening. Uh, so I'm Matt Levin. I'm uh, very honored to be the chair of the Hunger Mountain Cooperative Community Funds 
uh, advisory committee. Uh, and as those of you know who have been here for a number of years, uh, every year we have the privilege and honor of making some contributions to the community uh, using the resources of the co-op. <clears throat> so the community fund was started in 2005 to offer financial support to organizations and businesses and initiatives that are aligned with the co-op's mission. In the last seven years, uh, we've given out over $50,000 in grants to 49 different recipients. And it's a real privilege and honor, as I've said, to, to be part of this process where members of the community, businesses and organizations reach out to, to the co-op and ask for help in this unique way. And uh, it's part of a conversation that's really grown over the years. So the advisory committee that decides, uh, that, that processes these applications, that looks over what comes in every year, it's made up of, of member owners and council members and staff. And the committee makes the recommendations and then the council uh, makes the final decision about who gets uh, the grants each year. So we do use a criteria that's, that's set out. Uh, we have a formal process. The criteria includes alignment with the co-op's mission, uh, the anticipated project impact, and the applicant's access to other resources. We look for programs and projects that do not have other places to turn for assistance. And frankly, where a small contribution from our collective resources can make a big difference in supporting their work. So the fund is supported by donations from members uh, and the co-op's operations. So thank you to all of you who made donations to support the fund. It's a really critical part of what we do. And uh, this year, as in past years, the council uh, elected to put the uncashed patronage uh, refunds into the fund as well. So with all of that together, we can make a really important difference for these projects that are doing so much good work in the community. <clears throat> so this year, we, uh, we got seven applications. And we're very happy to announce that we were able to award $5,500 to two local organizations and one business. And uh, it's not a huge amount of money, but for a lot of these organizations, again, this is what can make the difference in their year-to-year -year operations. It can, what ma can make the difference in helping them recover from an emergency or a, a equipment failure, or for a business, it can help them get started and get a leg up. And I have to say, since we're ahead, Stephanie, I'm gonna take a moment. One of our favorite, pro well, my favorite projects is fat toad caramel, and we had this, and and we had this big discussion around the table at the at the committee. Should we be giving money to help a company that makes caramel? Like how? Like is that really? And right, you know, some people were like, "Of course." Have you ever had their? You know, yeah. and other people were like, "No, no, it's junk food." Well, it comes from goat milk, so it's not, you know. But, and, and it's a local product, and they're supporting the local economy. And so, you know, there's this big, we said, well, it's, you know, let's, it was a really good application. It was very well thought out. So we did it. And was it the next year that, so the, the next year at the fancy food show in New York City, Martha Stewart went to their booth and raved about their karma. We were like, yes, that's us. We, so, you know, that's not the core of what we do. Because we also do things like uh, buy trays and, and uh, reusable uh, silverware for uh, Meals on Wheels programs and make sure that projects have the kind of freezer and refrigerator space that they need to be able to make food last so that they can get it out to people in need in the community and help business, help, help small farms build uh, root cellars and, and help community gardens uh, plant trees and, and put in infrastructure. So it's really, it's really good work where, again, a few hundred dollars or a thousand dollars can make a really big difference. So this year, we have three recipients, and uh, I hope that there's someone here from each of the organizations so they can come up and be recognized. Um, and uh, we'll mail checks later, but we do have certificates for all of them. So the first recipient is Capstone Community Action from Barrie of $1,500. Uh, to help them make efficiency improvements in the food shelf. So
So we'll announce all the folks and then we'll uh, uh, give them their certificates. So second is the Family Center of Washington County in Montpelier, $1,500 to add fruit trees to their community garden and to upgrade their freezer capacity. And last is Herbcraft LLC of Middlesex, $2,500 to install a new refrigerator and freezer to increase their capacity to store raw ingredients for use in their beverage product. So Kari's giving out the certificates. We're taking pictures of them. Um, so thank you again to all of you for your support of this really great effort that we do as a, as a community. Again, it's a little bit amount of money from a lot of folks put together. It can have a really good impact and a really lasting impact on the community. Uh, if folks are interested in being part of the review committee, please let Kari know. We're always looking for new folks. And spread the word to organizations in the community. Let them know that we're here to help them. We, um, we open the process every year in, um, in July. Uh, and so you can look for that next summer. And thanks so much for all of us working together to help the community. OK, so I'm inviting Scott and Mark from the Co-op Council and Kari, the general manager, to present a series of reports next. And then we'll follow that. Pay attention closely, because there's questions and answers afterwards. And, and the questions are from you. So um, here we go. And Katie Michaels is going to present a couple of slides. I'll just go through these real quick. Mark, you're first. Okay. Substituting. All right, hello, everybody. I am the uh, treasurer of the, uh, uh, the council, and I have uh, some financial information to share with you all. So uh, you'll see our net sales for the, uh, for the fiscal year is $24.8 million. Woohoo, we did very good, or very well. Um, you'll see that uh, the, biggest, uh, the biggest part of that pie is the cost of goods sold. That is the amount of money we spend to buy the products to put in the store. Uh, the purple is the employee, employee compensation at 28%. And then uh, the olive colored uh, slice up there is everything else that goes into running the store in terms of heat, uh, repairs, uh, cleaning the parking lot of snow and all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, you'll see the bulk of the bulk of the expenses there in that uh, uh, in that pie chart. This, I think, is the uh, one of the most important slides that we have here. This is our sales growth uh, from 2010 to 2019. You'll see the that curve that's down in the middle that's sloping down towards zero. That's uh, this. This is probably one of the most important slides that we need to pay attention to. Uh, sales growth back in 2010 was 13.3 percent. Uh, this past year was a half a percent. Now we talk about sales growth, and, and uh, one of the things is we don't we don't try to get growth for growth's sake. One of the things why we we talk about sales growth is that so that we can do all the things that the co-op is doing in in terms of meeting meeting its ends. And uh, if you look at our impact report, which is on some of the tables on the side of the the uh, side of the side tables here. You'll see that we do have a big effect within the community, both with, uh, with supporting local producers, with, uh, with employees, with the compensation, with all the other things that go into, uh, go into the co-op. So um, one thing that this tells us is that now that trend may, may uh, reverse and it may go back up in years to come. It may dip below that, that uh, point. So. This has been on the council's radar for the last couple of years because we do see the trend of, of sales growth. Um, so keep that in mind. So uh, we do show profit for the year uh, and, and a patronage refund. One thing that you'll notice is that uh, we have 82, 000, about $82,000 uh, from earned income. We did have one anomalous line item uh, from reverted equity of $245,000. That was income that, that wasn't earned income. It went from our balance sheet to our profit and loss. Um, and that was because we, we applied uh, some of our rules of the bylaws to members who hadn't paid in their full equity. 
So it's kind of a one-time one time number that shows up on the, on the uh, profit and loss. In any case, we did declare a patronage refund, which, which we do every year if we show profit, and uh, a di distribution of 27,151. So, uh, so while this does show profitability, the, the real number of profitability is that 82,495. So out of 24 and whatever million dollars, uh, the total profit after everything else is paid for is, is only $82,000. And again, we're not looking to make huge profits, but that money can go into reinvestment into programs and, and things that the co-op does in order to uh, continue its mission. One thing we talked about over the last two or three years is the senior discount. You'll see that in 2010, the senior discount was uh, just under $30,000. Uh, this past year was $201,000. So this has grown at six times the rate of the sales growth of the co-op. So based on our, our uh, community conversations that we had over the last couple of years, the co-op resoundingly heard that, hey, don't let's not mess with our senior co-op. Uh, but this does continue to grow, and should our sales growth continue to decline like it is, it's going to be harder and harder to, to, uh, to pay for this, this discount. So uh, right now we do have, uh, for, those, for those seniors who are taking a discount but may not necessarily need it based on their financial condition, um, we, we do have a program where you can turn, turn off your senior discount and then the co-op can then use that, that, those funds or that discount to support other programs like co-op cares and, and other, other programs to, uh, to, to help with those who may not be able to afford it. Um, in the future, this, this, uh, if this trend continues, which it looks like it will, um, the count, the, uh, the co-op will have to make some decisions about how that's, how that's applied. So, uh, liabilities versus equity. This is the, the money we owe for, uh, versus the, the, the money that we have in hand. Uh, you'll see it's decreasing. That's the right trend. So, for every dollar that, uh, that, um, that we have, we owe 76 cents, and that's actually pretty good. Um, the council has been working over the, the last year, year and a half, to put ourselves in a good financial position to, to prepare ourselves should our sales growth continue to slow like it is. So uh, our thought is that if we, if we don't owe more, than, more money than, we're, than we have, we're being a, we'll be in a good position. Uh, to take advantage of uh, either a contracting market or any opportunities that might present itself. So total equity, this is, this is the money that the, the co-op has uh, in, in, the, uh, in the bank. Most of that money, you'll see uh, between 2018 and 2019, it gets a little flat on those curves there or on those bars. Um, that's because a bunch of money that was in 2019, that, that, that one time anomaly that I talked about came out of that bar and went on the profit and loss. So it's uh, kind of a transfer. Uh, but again, still going in the right direction in terms of being in a good financial position in order to take advantage of uh, a contracting market or any advantages that we might find in the marketplace. And that's it. Um, we're taking questions afterwards. Is that the? All right. So anyway, thank you very much. And uh, here's Scott. Or Thank you, Mark. This is, this is the, um, one of the most, I think, amazing statistics that we see every single year. Um, we are up to, as it says, almost 9,500 members for a community of 7,500 in Montpelier, a, a county of only 60,000 people. So although our sales growth is, um, has kind of flattened out a little bit, um, we still have a tremendous amount of new members on a, uh, on a monthly basis, and the council is always amazed on the, uh, on the reception that we're getting and more and more people. It's about 70% of our sales um, are from members, um, and it's just, it's just an, amazing, an amazing fact. Um, we also get, on the, uh, when we have the surveys, we have a tremendous and high degree of um, acceptability and, uh, and confidence from our members. Our co-op employees, um, we're up to 175, 172, and uh, based on the um, legislatures, the Vermont legislature's um, wage model, um, 
after three months, um, actually all employees are earning a livable wage after three months. Um, and most of them, uh, we will offer tremendous benefits, um, full health care, dental eye care, and I think 50% for, um, for their family too. And uh, local producers, we, we Hunger Mountain Co-op, 40% of our sales are local products. It's one of the highest co-op sales in the country. Um, continue to, that's one of the, one of the, I think, strongest reasons why people shop at the co-op. And here's just some of the stats and figures um, which makes us so popular and I think that's why most of us shop here. And we're just such a, a, a magnet as our two guests were saying that so many companies have just started, started out with, um, with selling their sales at the co-op. And that's uh, certainly one of the biggest emphasis that I think uh, Kari and his staff continually work on in acquiring uh, more local products. <clears throat> and finally, um, the last couple of years, we've been working on uh, our bylaws, uh, re redoing our bylaws. And we have a committee. These are the people, obviously, that are on the committee. Um, on our website, uh, after each meeting, our notes are posted. Uh, we're slowly working on... Um, on revising them. Some of them are minor issues, some of them are major. Um, we will be wrapping that up in the not too distant future and presenting it to the council. And then after that, there'll be, there'll be numerous forums, informational um, sessions. And then at some point when we're ready, we'll have a special, we'll, uh, have a special meeting um, where we will be explaining and, and voting. Actually, the explaining will be done before then. Um, but then we will be presenting to the, uh, to the membership some bylaw changes. So I, I encourage you all to keep an eye out for the forums, uh, the groups that we're going to, um, the, the forums and the sessions that we will be having um, at the co-op. And uh, please read the, uh, the minutes and the notes that are posted on the, uh, on the website. Katie? Hi, everyone. So in the past year, issues of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion have been ones that the council has spent some focused time and attention on. And while acknowledging that we have more to do, um, we had a half day training this past February on unconscious bias. There's a subcommittee of the council that's been reading and discussing materials related to gender. And now we're in the process of shifting to some readings related to race that the committee's discussing and the full council is reading. And uh, on the whole, I think we acknowledge that we have more to do in this regard, but that issues of justice and equity and diversity are really important, both within our co-op and our broader community, and we hope that we can play both a leadership and a partnership role in this regard. And um, another area that we've been working on in the past year is to educate ourselves about some of the changes that are happening in Montpelier and the communities surrounding us in Montpelier. Um, we invited a series of guests listed above who have spoken about topics like the local food system, food insecurity, demographic trends, the union and others. Um, and from this learning generated a list of potential strategic initiatives that the co-op could focus on in order to both accomplish our mission and our ends and do the good work we're doing, but in the context of the changes that are going on in our community and given the financial situation of the co-op, we want to do this um, in ways that either grow sales and or reduce expenses. So we've given a list of potential strategic priorities to the management team to explore and think through, and they're going to report back to the council about those in the months ahead. And in general, um, the council's here to make sure that we're doing what you guys want us to do. And so we want to hear from you. We encourage all members to come to meetings, um, to reach out to any of us individually, and or to join the dinner and discussion event that we hold every spring. We want to hear your opinions. Thanks. OK, I'm next. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Kari Bradley, the general manager. And uh, thank you for being here. This is a, a great turnout especially on what feels like a midwinter night. So um, I'm going to kick it off and talk about a couple of the challenges that the co-op is facing. This first slide 
um, was actually part of that community learning project that, um, that Katie just spoke to. This came from Ben Kidder of the Department of Labor. And we've heard about the aging of Vermont, but this, this slide really kind of painted it bit more vividly for me. What it does is it breaks down the Washington County population into four age groups, indexes it to 100 back in the year 2000. And what you see is that out of the four, one of the groups, the 65 um, years and older group has grown, and it's grown about 40 something percent. And the other three age cohorts have gone down, uh, especially the zero to 19 age group. So this is not exactly news, but it's a, it kind of it, it paints the picture pretty well. And how this relates to the co-op is it definitely impacts the customer base. It's, it's, it's harder for the co-op to attract new customers because of this. And it's also impacting the labor market, of course, because as people are retiring and leaving the workforce, that means that um, all businesses are really having more challenges in recruiting and uh, retaining employees. And uh, the co-op's been fortunate. We've had a very low level um, rate of, of employee turnover over the years, but we are now starting to feel the pinch, um, especially in the category of, of employees that are substitute if they don't have a regular schedule, but they're uh, used to fill in for when people um, take time off. It's become harder to find folks to, to fill those roles. So that's one challenge. And I also wanted to just say a, a few words about our uh, contract negotiations with our employees union. I know there's uh, some employees that are going to speak to that in a little bit, but I just wanted to talk about um, um, the, a couple of the key issues that are still on the table. Um, if you haven't heard, this process has gone on much longer than usual. Um, we, we try to wrap it up um, back in June, actually, um, so that the start of the fiscal year, we're working with a new contract. And, um, uh, but we haven't been able to reach agreement uh, because of two key issues. One is wages. We haven't come to an agreement on what the wage structure should be for um, the, the next two, two to three years. And um, I just want to say that uh, for me and for the leadership of the co-op and for the co-op overall, um, employee compensation is a very important value. You know, there's, there's just no question about that. Um, Scott went through um, some of the components of the compensation program, including the benefits. Um, Mark shared with you that, that we allocate a large amount of the sales dollars to, um, to employee compensation. Um, we are really at the sort of the upper end of what food co-ops do in that regard. And um, so, so, you know, we should be, uh, we, and we are proud of, of, of what we've accomplished. Um, that said, you know, we want to continue to make improvements and um, the co-op um, has offered average annual increases of between 2.8 and 3.6% over the next two to three years in terms of wage increases. That does include staying open for a couple of holidays where we're closed now as part of our proposal. Um, but we feel like this is a responsible um, offer um, in the context of what Mark was sharing in terms of our financial uh, outlook, um, and you know, we're really trying. We've we've been walking a very fine line for many years in terms of our profitability, um, as Mark shared with you. And uh, we just we need to be responsible in terms of the increases that we can offer. Unions asking for um, more, and, um, and we're just trying to work through that process of coming to an agreement. The other big uh, issue is. Um, is based on a proposal from the union about what they call bargaining unit work. And it has to do with the hands-on tasks that a lot of customers will, will experience. So the um, stocking the shelves and cleaning and customer service and uh, preparing food and working the cash registers. Uh, these, are the, these are the tasks that, um, that the, the folks in the bargaining unit routinely do. We also have our managers doing those from time to time. And the union has um, proposed that we would place restrictions on the ability of managers to do that work. And, uh, you know, we see a lot of benefit for um, having managers be involved with their teams and, and be part of that, um, the work at hand. Um, and we've offered some compromises in terms of limitations that we could accept. But again, we haven't been able to, to reach agreement on that. So I'm going to um, shift now and to talk a little bit more about the year-end reports and um, really 
encourage us to think in terms of impact. I was invited to speak at the Morrisville Food Co-op annual meeting um, a couple, couple, three week, weeks ago. They just celebrated two years in, in business as a store, and really my message to them was, you did it, you created a store, <clears throat> it's really hard to do, and <clears throat> Excuse me. What that does is it, it gives them a vehicle to now have impact in their community, and they're starting to do that, and they have the um, capacity to do a lot more. We too, as a co-op, measure our success in terms of the impacts that we're having uh, in a, a wide variety of values that, uh, um, that are encapsulated in our mission and our ends. So. Um, whether it's in terms of community, on the left you see um, our donations and sponsorships have grown over the past uh, five years. We're able to give back about $46,000 last year in donations and sponsorships. On the other hand, uh, workshop attendance in terms of our educational mission has really declined over the past five years. We're getting a lot fewer people turning out for workshops. Um, which, which says that we need to do, um, we need to find new opportunities, new ways of, of getting information to people that works for them. Uh, Co-op Cares is our, um, our uh, member discount for low-income members, and when we were having the conversations about member discounts over the past couple years, people said loud and clear, we really think that uh, resources that are available should be, should be provided to members who are least able to afford the co-op. So we've done some um, focused, concentrated outreach to uh, local nonprofits and community partners and have been able to increase the number of households, 164 um, households that uh, were involved with Co-op Cares last year. And then the last one is the um, Cooperative Community Fund. Um, as Matt was explaining, uh, part of this fund is an endowment that's here for the community for the long term, and we've been able to build up the assets in that portion um, up to over 82,000 over the last uh, few years. In terms of environmental sustainability, it was sort of a mixed uh, uh, report card this last year. Um, this slide is showing um, tons of carbon emitted, and uh, we were making steady progress in bringing that number down, and then the number bounced back up this last year. And the, the main reason for that is that we uh, replaced our heating and cooling system, um, and uh, although the unit is more efficient, it's actually properly sized for the building, and it's in is um, providing the right amount of heating and cooling um, for the space that we have. So we're sort of right sizing and hopefully it'll be more comfortable in the hottest and coolest part of the years, but it was a, somewhat of a step back in terms of energy usage. In terms of uh, waste diversion, it's important that we acknowledge that Co-op's doing a lot. We uh, composted 81 tons of material, uh, organic material last year. That's keeping it out of the landfill and, and going to Vermont compost and grow compost to become potting soils and other things. And then um, 141 tons, it's a estimated um, uh, that we recycled and kept out of the landfill. And I also wanna um, point out a couple places where there's been some innovation over the past couple of years. Our green team has really led the effort on this alternative recycling using the ARC program over in Barrie. If you're not familiar, there's a real, real resource there in terms of recycling materials that aren't part of the single source mainstream recycling stream. Uh, so just as an example from last year, 54 gallons of bottle caps recycled at the co-op and 137 pounds of corks. This is kind of fascinating. Um, and then um, bag credits. We've seen a, an increase in the number of bag credits and um, you uh, customers bringing credit bags back um, so we don't have to issue a, a new one. Um, over 226,000 bag credits last year. And then uh, food. Is there an, an, just another area to um, think about the impact that we're having, of course. And uh, in terms of fresh food, we've seen a large um, um, increase in the percentage of and the amount of uh, the fresh categories that we're selling, and, um, which we take to be a marker for, for healthy food. Um, we heard about local, um, you know, roughly 40% uh, of the products that we sell are coming from local, which we define as grown or value added within Vermont or 100 miles of Montpelier. And then, uh, obviously, organic, certified organic is very important value for the co-op, and about 30% of our products come from there. And then we also consider other co-ops to be part of our community. We're, we, we want uh, there to be a strong co-op network. And last year, we sold a million dollars in products from other co-ops. That's about 4%. Okay, so um, that is the presentation, and we're gonna open it up. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, all right, so the format for the question and answer is going to be like this. I'm going to ask uh, your questions and comments about anything at all that you would like to talk about. I would request that you keep your contribution, your comment or your question to 30 seconds or under. I do have a harmonica in my pocket. It's sort of like the Academy Awards if you run too far over. Um, and we'll do that for about 10 minutes. I'm actually going to start and see if there's questions from people who are watching um, on ORCA and have questions online and then open it up. And then I'm going to, by prearrangement, have uh, some staff members address the co-op community for, for a few minutes, and then we'll have some more open questions and comments. So that's our format. Um, and Jess, do we have any questions? No, nobody online has one. So OK, how about somebody who's live? What would you like to know or comment on or talk about? Uh, my name is Sandal Kate, and I have a question about rounding up. Um, when you go through the line, it's a voluntary thing, and you could sort of sign up somehow. I also, I'd love to know how that's going, the rounding up, and then if there's some way to maybe promote it a little bit more by having a visible sign on the back of the cash registers or something like that because sometimes I have to remember to say oh sure you can round up or the clerk may remember to ask me if I want to round up but I think that must add up considerably but I'd love to have an example of maybe one month of rounding up who's taking that one I, I don't have I don't have data. Um, I know that we've been able to raise you know hundreds of dollars, not not thousands, but hundreds of dollars for local community partners. I, and I and I believe last month was the largest amount, but I don't have the, the number at my fingertips. And your point about promoting, I think that's that's uh, right on. You know, we just need to encourage people to um, think about it, be aware. There's no pressure to do it, but if uh, if um, you know uh, you know if it uh, if, we, if more people do it, more um, it's a way to really have that impact in the community um, because I know the, the organizations really value it. Great. What else would you like to know back here? I'm going to run up with my microphone. I kept forgetting to round up and they told me they could put something, excuse me, something on my card that they, someone was just allowed to ask me that I gave the cashier permission to say, do you want to round up? And I think you could probably promote that because um, I think it's wonderful that you don't ask as a regular thing. Um, but if you want to be reminded every time you come, you could promote that in the newsletter and just say, you know, let us round up. So great idea. Thanks. I'll just look up if there's a council member or, or if, Kari, you want to respond to something, just wave in case I okay. don't get it. Who else has a question or comment? Over here. There was the chart of the um, growth rate, and it was zigzagged up and down. And I was wondering if anybody could say something about what factors influence that. Why is the slope going down, and what caused the spikes? Um, what is influencing the growth rate? Sure, I'll, I'll take a crack at that. Um, so what the, the factors that go into sales growth are um, the number of customers and how much the customers spend. And um, what we've seen in recent times is that the number of transactions has actually been decreasing for the last three years. Um, Probably the main reason for this is that there are more options. People have, have more um, outlets that they can shop at, and that includes driving to Costco or um, direct from farmers or online. Um, uh, there's just a lot more places to get the products that we sell. And this is not uncommon um, for food co-ops, for natural food stores. It's just more competitive. And, and it, this is not a particularly competitive market, but, but there is competition for us. Um, and then the other part is um, uh, how much people spend on average. 
Um, we have seen some growth there. Um, a component of how much they spend is price inflation. So all the time, prices are generally going up, and we pass, you know, our costs go, we go up, we pass that along in terms of the price increase. This, this slide is actually adjusted for price inflation. So we're using a CPI number from the uh, state government or the federal government, and I think the one of the reasons that it's bouncing up and down is that those are estimates that that, that price inflation. If we removed it and we just looked at just the raw number, it's a lot smoother. Um, so I think there's a lot of assumptions in calculating what inflation is, but but that's the that's the main thing. And the really and the important point or the take takeaway is that, as Mark said, we're not trying to grow for growth's sake. We need to. We want to grow for impact, and we also want to grow so that we can match the um, with the growth in our expenses. All, all businesses, all organizations, all expenses are incurring more. more uh, households are incurring more expenses over time, and we just want to keep pace, if nothing else. I, I think my question is about the next slide back. <clears throat> um, it's the one with all the numbers on it. Uh, oh, no, uh, this, that one. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm a little confused about the difference between the bottom two numbers, total patronage refund and refund distributed. Yep. And I know there's an explanation for it because I've heard it before, but if you could do it again, that sure. would be great. So a patronage refund is a unique feature that's provided for co-ops, cooperatives. Um, by the IRS, it's actually a, a pretty neat thing that we get to benefit from. From um, as a consumer co-op, if we make a profit, we have the ability to return um, some of that profit to you, the owners. And um, that's you know, there's there's a way to calculate the the total number that's allowed, and then the um, co-op has the ability to determine how much of that to distribute in in cash or credit, and how much to retain. Uh, uh, there is that option to retain a portion. Um, the IRS requires that at least 20% be distributed as cash. There's a sort of long-standing um, rule. Um, and this year, given that most of the income came from this one-time conversion that Mark was speaking, was this coming current with our bylaws, which say that if a member has not made their full equity investment and not shopped at the co-op for at least three years, then their investment becomes common capital. We haven't really caught up with that rule in many years. So we did that this year for the first time. And so the vast majority of that net income and, and the patronage refund, um, the 135,000 portion, is actually coming from money that we already had. We didn't earn it in terms of operations. So that was the reason that the refund that we're distributing later this winter is on the low side. It's actually the 20%, the minimum, um, because it really reflects that we, we weren't actually all that profitable last year. Is that helpful? Great. So, and that, and that uh, refund will probably be around February, and it'll be issued as a credit, so that it, um, if, you know, if someone wants a check, uh, we, can, we can do that. But um, most people prefer to just deduct it from their, their, um, their purchase. Hi, I know how much I spend a year at the co-op. I was just wondering what the average is. What does the each member pay on the average? I don't know the answer to that. Am I on? It's a good question. Okay. Am I ready? Am I ready? Should I go? Okay. Oh, she's got a microphone. I have a microphone. Yeah. Go. <laughs> I'm going. Okay. Um, okay. So I know we are a co-op and we have this patronage fund and that we give money back when we have money to give back. But I'm sure I'm not alone in feeling like that's probably not, I mean, I get like a 12 or a $20, whatever might come back. So I think about like how much effort and time and money it went to actually, you know, search that out and produce the check and, you know, send it all back. So is there a way just to say, hmm, maybe I don't want that, don't even go through the process, save the money, and it would be better spent elsewhere? 
You are absolutely right that uh, it does take a lot of effort, but by law we're required to return 20% of profits uh, back to the member. So that's in statute. We can't we can't get around that. However, you can take your uh, patronage refund and put it to the uh, community fund if you'd like. So uh, if it's you know if it's a little bit amount, it make a, a big difference to those people who are applying to uh, for grants for next year. Yeah, if you if you just simply don't do anything with it, it'll revert back to an unclean patronage refund. Yes, it's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to pause the general question and answers for a few minutes, and this uh, there's some staff members who are invited to address the co-op community, and then we'll go back to some um, questions and comments that you have. Lisa. Thank you. Um, I actually don't feel like I was invited. I kind of put my force here. My name is Lisa Rochelle. I've been a member for 13 years and a staff member for five. First, I am deeply grateful to the staff that have dedicated so many years of their life to our co-op, our union, and our community. I know it isn't easy and you deserve much more than that beautiful plate and an unfair wage proposal. Second, I would like to speak this year about transparency and the lack of it at the co-op. The co-op embraces the concept of open book management but in our co-op world, that really means we only show you what we want you to know. Where are the pages that say we can't afford to give our workers a fair raise? Asking staff to give up two paid holidays and time with their family in order to pay for their own seven cent raise is shameful to me as a co-op member and unacceptable as a worker. Transparency for salary and the benefit package of our management team is an absolute necessity. Is there a gender pay gap at our cooperative? Without transparency, we just don't know. How do we know the pay gap between our highest paid employee, where there's rumors that includes a car, and the lowest, uh, lowest is the, in the alignment with our members' values and our cooperative principles? While we have so many staff that can't afford to shop where they work. I've spoken in the past at the lack of trust between the staff and management. The co-op even spent $6,000 hiring a company to confirm the mistrust between us with little to no action of change. We still operate under a punitive environment and not a teaching one. I believe transparency is key to rebuilding that trust. Please support the staff. And by the way, the union wage scale is published right here and it's available to any member who requests it. Transparency is accountability, and we need a transparency bylaw. Please add transparency bylaw to the bylaws. I thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Amelia Salata Hartman. I am the chief steward of UE Local 255 and a member of the negotiating committee. After 100 hours at the bargaining unit table, as well as six months spent negotiating our contract with management, they continue to ask us to give up our paid holidays to pay for our own raises. Management has received raises without making any such sacrifice. If we do not agree to this, we will only receive a seven cent raise. Kari painted our positions as being very close on wages. My question is that is, if that is the case, why have we seen no forward movement from management in four months? They will tell you that union employees already receive an annual raise. That is our experience pay and not something that we bargain at the table. We have never bargained that at the table. This year of contract negotiation has been a shifting landscape of different rules being applied. Furthermore, in the recent negotiating session, they suggested not paying us retroactively to our July 1st start date when we should have had our new contract. This, much like negotiating a raise separately from the annual experience raise, has always been the practice. Tactics such as these do nothing to build trust between management and the union. Another outstanding issue is management's continued practice of expecting and allowing department managers to regularly perform hours 
of work normally assigned to union employees. This erodes our bargaining unit by concealing the obvious need to more, for more labor hours. Co-op management has continued to refuse to properly invest in its workers by adding these labor hours to department schedules despite an ever-increasing workload. This refusal has led to increased stress, low morale, and injuries, as well as adding to the already heavy workload of department managers. They are being asked to do unpaid overtime, which they said at the bargaining table to us when we questioned them how the managers were performing their own jobs as well as ours. That is an exploitative practice that I don't think lines up with the co-op's values. We are asking for support from the community in our effort to secure a fair contract and a safe and healthy workplace. If anybody wants any more information, we have handouts. We also have buttons if you want to show your support for our staff. Thank you. Hello, my name is Melissa Pelkey and I have been part of co-op communities for many years. This community for the last 10 years and have worked at Hunger Mountain Co-op for over seven years. I have seen how over the time most co-ops have lost their way, focusing more on profit rather than serving the community as they were originally created to do. I feel that it's important that the co-op members hear from the employee perspective how the decisions of the co-op impact, impact all of us as a community. While I love the co-op, the community and the co-op model, I am concerned that it is becoming more corporate as are co-ops across the country. This is largely due to the increased influence of national co-op organizations such as NCG, CDS, which is now known as Culminate, and UNFI. According to NCG's website, National Co-op Grocers is a business services cooperative that represents 148 co-ops in 38 states. NCG states that they help unify natural food co-ops, thus making co-ops just like all the other corporate grocery stores. Culminate claims to help existing cor corporate cooperatives retain their vitality and plan for future growth opportunities. So it's likely no surprise that their clients are existing cooperatives that seek to expand as Hunger Mountain continues to include in its business plans. Culminate has also been known to influence co-ops to change their bylaws and remove member owner control, which has already been tried here at Hunger Mountain. One Hunger Mountain manager has worked as a consultant for CDS, which is now known as Culminate. While the co-op does need to remain financially viable in order to be sustainable, it does not need to do so at the cost of its members, employees, and values. United Natural Foods Incorporated is one of the biggest corporations in natural food distribution and is where Hunger Mountain orders most of its food it sells. NCG negotiates contracted rates for NCG member co-ops, which stipulates that UNFI be the primary distributor for co-ops and that they contribute to a joint liability fund. While these types of organizations and corporate ties may increase the buying power, sales, and popularity of co-ops, they also erode the autonomy of cooperatives, the focus on supporting local food producers, and the control of members and workers. We need to retain control as a community of members of our co-op and ensure that it continues to retain the values it was founded on. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, Amelia, and Melissa. So do you, um, is there a brief response that you want to take, or should we go to community questions I'll, and I'll answers? Let me just say that um, in addition to compensation being important value for the co-op, we also want to obviously provide a, a great workplace. And you know, it, it's a little painful to hear that, that people don't you know, enjoy the workplace, don't value the workplace as much as we'd like them to, and obviously that's a challenge that we need to work on. Okay, sorry, I didn't, didn't mean to mischaracterize. Okay, do you want to respond to me? Yeah, absolutely. We value our workplace. We just believe that we deserve equitable raises, just as management has received, and that we don't deserve to have to fight for that for six months now with no movement from management. All 
All right. I'm going to open it up for this discussion or anything else that people want to talk about for a little while longer. Who'd like to weigh in? Back there. First of all, having been a, a member of this co-op pretty much since its inception way back when it was the Plainfield Co-op, a pre-order co-op before it became Hunger Mountain Co-op, I've seen through many years, and I want to say to the staff, I greatly appreciate all that you do and the fact that you are there working hard, serving the customers, with a smile and care. And many of you have been there many years, but then I come to the annual meeting and I find out all these things that are um, concerns. Um, and as a low income earner who has never averaged a livable wage in 50 years of working, <laughs> I really <laughs> empathize with you, but I, I would like to find out more frequently what the issues are, what's going on in the union negotiations, um, and is there some way that that can be communicated to the members on a more regular basis? Where could I find out that so I can, you know, be supportive and be more understanding? And I see there's some offering of flyers, and I also wanted to say that um, members of the staff and the council be, will be around for a few minutes after, um, and if there's a desire to continue the conversation, we may figure out ways to do that, so write it on your comment cards as well. Um, other comments and questions? Elizabeth. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Jesdale, staff member and co-op member. Um, I just wanted to answer your question. Um, any of us staff can answer those questions to you um, at work. We do have a free speech clause in our union contract that we fought very hard to maintain two years ago, and we were successful in maintaining that. So we are allowed to talk to you um, about any topic, provided that we're not um, uh, representing pretending to represent the co-op or claiming to represent the, the co-ops. So, so you can talk to us. Great, thanks. All right. Uh, this, this is more like a comment. Um, I just wanted to find out what is the real reason why every time I go into the counter that I am being asked if, are you Rolanda? And I always wanted to joke and say, yeah, because I haven't changed my name <laughs> lately. So um, I just wanted to know why I am being asked every time. And if that's the case, um, why don't we just print like a card with our number and with our picture in the back? Um, so I guess that's my comment for tonight. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Does uh, anyone want to take that? Okay. Hi, I'm Andrea Mills. I work in the front end. We always try to um, verify the customers' names. We have so many customers. We have a lot of new staff members. So you can give us your number, and we just want to verify your name so that in case we made a wrong entry, it doesn't get credited to someone else's account. Does that make sense? It's the only store I go to, too, where I'm greeted by name every time. <laughs> it's, a little, it's both wonderful and, and uh, unusual. Yeah. Ste Stephanie, I'm yes. just going to answer go ahead. two questions. Um, I'm going to give a little bit more information. Everybody can hear me. I've been encouraging everybody else to put the microphone up. OK, so uh, the answer to one of the questions, absolutely talk to the staff if you have questions while you're at the co-op. But another way that you can get information about the union negotiations, you can ask for the packet that each council member gets 
at the beginning of the month. That's public information that any co-op member can access. They just have to call Kari and he will provide either a printed copy or uh, an email version of it. And you can see the, uh, the report that he gives to the council about what the union negotiations are, at least from the management side. If you want the staff side, of course, please speak with the staff. So that's information that is on the website. I'm not sure where it is in the store, but everybody here and all the other 9,000 members can access that information if they want to, okay? So uh, that was one of the things. And the other thing is, as far as the card is concerned, it used to be that you had to actually fish the card out of your wallet and hand it over to the, um, to the, uh, the clerk and they would scan it. And that's how you would know, uh, that's how the membership was verified. And it switched from that to asking the member what their number was so that they didn't have to take the card out of their wallet. So in either case, it's awkward. Um, I'm not sure which is less awkward, but um, at some point, some maybe in the past five years, there was a changeover from that. So I hope that gives you a little bit more of a sense of, um, a little bit more of the history of the uh, membership ID. Um, thank you. Okay, I'm just gonna take a few more. Uh, we have an online, oh, I think I have a, you have a question about Uh, yeah, I was wondering um, that everything you sell is organic, or are there some things that aren't organic in the store? Um, actually, no. Um, uh, only 30% of our sales came from certified organic products last year. So a lot of natural, a lot of local, a lot of fresh, um, and a good portion of it is organic. Can you give Jess the microphone for the online question, and then I'll go to Rick. Uh, this is more of a comment. I think it was regarding uh, the negotiations. The co-op could allow letters from members and the staff in its newsletter and could also sponsor an online forum for member discussions about various issues. Great, thank you. Um, Rick Barstow, and my question is concerning the senior member discount. And I was wondering if there was a way that wouldn't be too complicated to say, well, whether having 6% or 0%, if there's some way, um, 3 or 4% would, would be better for me, but going down to 0% um, <clears throat> discount would be a little more burdensome. I was wondering some way to, to make it flexible. Thoughts um, from the council or? I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure, but that's an interesting idea. We um, there's been versions of that that were knocked around in our discussions, but in terms of allowing a, a member to just pick the, the level that they're going to stick with for a period of time, um, it, obviously in theory that's that's great. We just had, we would have to figure out how to do it technically. So thank you for the suggestion. Okay. Um, I've got a uh, sort of a practical question. Um, several years ago, uh, you said that it was less expensive for the co-op if we use debit cards rather than credit cards. And I was wondering if that's still the case. And um, also, I'm wondering why the, um, the swiping process at the cash register has changed. I liked using just the wave. You can, use, you can wave your, um, your credit union card and it used to be a debit card. Now if you waive it, it automatically defaults to being a credit card. And it seems like that's undercutting your, um, right. The, right. The, the savings that you had from me using my debit card. Yeah, yeah. So first, first part, um, yes, uh, debit cards are less expensive for the co-op. The, the, the merchant fees or the fees that are applied to merchants for credit cards range quite a bit and some of them are quite high, especially those reward cards. Debit cards we think is probably the least impactful um, tender, even, even less than cash in some cases, just in terms of the handling. And the second part of the question, we had recently had an upgrade, so I think that's a short-term issue um, that will be rectified as soon as the you know, programmers can do it. 
I think there's two or three more, and then I think I will close it up. I see you too. All right, we have one. Yes, more. yes. Um, my name is Stephen Farnham. I'm a member of the council. And uh, I wanted to thank Scott for bringing up the point about the uh, bylaw process that we're going through. And I just wanted to um, emphasize that um, it's entirely an open process. All of our committee meetings are open if anybody would like to attend. And um, we do have um, information sessions from time to time in which we invite you all to come and hear about the progress, make comments. You can get in touch with anybody who's on that committee if you have any thoughts you'd like to share. And um, I also wanted to add that the process is going to be one where we do the best we can to um, overhaul the uh, kind of uh, disorganization of the um, bylaws without making any substantive changes in what they actually mean or what the effect they have. And then the plan is to have some separately voted items um, following that that are not attached to approving the actual um, um, rewrite. So they don't necessarily have to happen. You can have one or the other or both. And um, there has been some talk about transparency being one of those issues. So whether you support it or don't, that's something that we're talking about. So if you have any uh, comments you'd like to give to any one of us, don't be afraid to let us know. Thank you. Okay, I have um, three or four hands up, and I've, so let me just recognize who I'm gonna call on and then we'll close it out. I have one, I had one over here still, and I have one there, okay. Um, so right now, I'll do these two. Okay. Hi, my name's Andrew Sullivan, and I am not a huge fan of Facebook, but I just wanted to mention that our local labor union, UE 255, has a Facebook page, and absolutely anyone can get information from our union anytime they want. So, just wanted to put that out there. Thank you, Andrew. There, and I'm going to come back here. Uh, I'm going to go here uh, and then there. Do I have with respect to the uh, decrease in the growth rate, um, there's a new business on Berry Street that's getting a lot of traffic. And is there any, and uh, I'm assuming a lot of that traffic doesn't even know the co-op exists, you know, a few feet away. Is there any way the co-op can develop a way of letting these people know that they could stop into the cafe or come and buy something? Because that business is, you know, is generating a lot of, People. You're spoke, speaking about Bar Hill, I take it? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable, isn't it? Yeah, right place, right time for that business. Um, uh, yes, I'm sure there are ways we, we, um, we need to talk with them and sort of um, try some things and, and see what can be done. Hello, my name is Cindy McLeod, and while I work for the co-op, I'm not speaking as a union member, I'm speaking as a member. Um, I originally got involved with the co-op back in 1977 when it was the Plainfield Co-op and I have been a long-term member, raised my kids there, and I'm a great advocate of the co-op. Um, when I retired I, seven years ago, I came and I started working at the co-op as a cashier and I think I am the oldest cashier there. I don't work a lot of hours, but I love it. And I just want to tell you that um, a great many employees love working at the co-op. They love their customers. We love our customers. We love what we're doing. And all we're asking is that we be treated with respect because being a long-term member, this is my co-op too, and I've invested a lot of time and effort through the years in this co-op, and I really feel strongly about it and its values. And I just want to leave with that feeling that we're not a corporation, we're a co-op, and I remember how we were founded, 
and I've seen us grow, and I still love it today, most of it. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Cindy. This is the last comment. I do see other hands up. I see a number of other hands up, but I'm going to ask you to use your comment cards and hang around with us afterwards for a few minutes after this comment, because I'm going to pass it on after this so we can close the meeting. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Jezdio, co-op member 8295, as all my cashiers know. Um, this comment is actually very related to those of you that have your hands up and are not being allowed to speak. This right here in this room is the highest decision-making body of this cooperative, period. Not the council, not the general manager, not me. This body, this annual meeting, this is your co-op. 15 minutes is not enough. This 15 minutes is not enough to have a discussion about any of the points that anybody has brought up in this room. Those of you that have your hands up are not going to have the opportunity to speak. I am, and I'm grateful for that. And I apologize to those of you who are not having the opportunity to speak. 15 minutes is not acceptable. And this is your co-op. Don't accept 15 minutes. <laughs> We've got almost 10,000 members of this co-op. A little 30 seconds, not, not okay. That's not democracy. So um, I'm being asked to wrap it up, so thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. I appreciate that. And we, 35 minutes into this conversation, um, which uh, is still not enough for this group, but I appreciate people hanging on and uh, we're, we're here to continue the conversation for a while afterwards. So we do have a couple of more things to wrap up and uh, I'm going to ask Eric Jacobson to come and present the Hunger Mountain Cooperative Community Award this year. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm Eric Jacobson. I've been on the board now two years working on an ethics committee, which we haven't had much time to talk about tonight. But one of the ideas we had uh, on the council is to develop a, an award, a Hunger Mountain Co-op Award, to um, <clears throat> celebrate individual contributions that are trying to turn the tide on some issues that are dear uh, to us or uh, have made a lifelong contribution to this community. So um, I'm going to, in a minute, turn uh, the microphone over to a member, Susan Turner, who, who will speak to this. But I want to welcome you. I think this has been a successful idea, and we're going to continue. So we welcome you to continue to make nominations and also lifetime achievement. You know, it could also be a lifetime achievement going forward. So um, without further ado, let me welcome member Susan. Thank you, Eric. Well, the first recipient of the Hunger Mountain Co-op Community Award not only reflects the co-op's goals, but has taken an idea and built it into an organization that benefits many of the communities here in central Vermont. She selflessly serves the farm community the food insecure community, and the dedicated community of organizations serving those who others otherwise may be unable to access fresh and local produce. As a volunteer, I can attest to the fact that she also serves a community of volunteers who care deeply, and we appreciate her knowledge and leadership in helping us to contribute to the well-being of our neighbors. She unites everyone in purpose and expects more of herself than of anyone else. This year's recipient 
has proven herself in multiple ways, drawing us closer together. The farmers, the fed, the feeders, the volunteers. Her development of these networks has enriched central Vermont in both tangible and intangible ways. Thank you, Hunger Mountain Co-op, for the opportunity to honor and to thank the founder of Community Harvest of Central Vermont, Allison Levin. Well, thank you, Kari, and thank you, Susie, um, so much. And, and thank the co-op for this um, great honor. They have been a big part in making the work of Community Harvest of Central Vermont possible. Uh, sorry, a little teary. Um, and um, their, their partnership has been just one piece of the puzzle that has made this work possible um, in here in Central Vermont, as, as Susie indicated. Um, our work with many farmers and their generosity and sharing their bounty with not just um, the markets that they sell to, but also the community um, has been what makes this work possible. And I'm just the a person helping to drive that mission, but it really takes all of the community together to build this this effort and and recover the food that would otherwise go to waste in the community. So people like Susie and other the the 200 to 200 to 300 other volunteers in the community that um, help us do this work and all of the other organizations, the food shelves, the senior meal programs. Uh, other organizations feeding people with limited access to fresh local food, all working together to make it possible for everyone in our community to have fresh local food, um, whether they can purchase it at the co-op or whether they are not able to do that. Um, we want to make it possible for them to eat um, healthy food, and we have so much of it here in our community. We want to make sure that it, that isn't going to waste, and I'm just sort of the cheerleader to help that make that happen. It really takes the community working together to to do that work and the 40 farmers and individuals that we get the food from and the 20 recipient organizations that we donate it to and all of you who are able to help in different ways, whether that's volunteering with us, whether it's out in the fields today in the mud and the snow, <laughs> or um, helping behind the scenes doing data entry or con contributing to our organization financially, um, which um, many organizations and businesses, including the co-op, are able to do. Um, it really takes us all working together to help the community um, eat really good food. And we really appreciate it. And thank you so much for the honor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to run through some uh, thank yous and we'll wrap it up here. I want to thank the, our host, Lost Nation Theater. And um, our photographer tonight is member owner Paul Richardson of Richardson Photography. Um, child, child care um, was covered by member owner Stephanie Picard, Nori Towns, Rain Towns, and Peyton Smith. Thank you very much. Of course, the dinner that was provided by our prepared foods department, including Chef Doug. And the drinks were provided by Morse Block Deli. I want to thank Stephanie as our facilitator and Lisa who's been taking notes tonight and all the co-op staff and our member owners who have helped set up and then will help clean up in just a moment. And I want to give a special thank you to our community relations team, Stephanie Kanonen, Robin Joy, Jess Knapp, and Mary Trafton. Thank you very much. And on this slide, there are a number of um, businesses and organizations that uh, volunteered or, or um, provided raffles and that sort of thing. Can I just thank Pizzazz Pottery 
for making the plates and our award artist, Matt C. Schultz. And as, as I mentioned earlier, I want to thank the three departing council members, Shannon Leslie that's not here right now, Ashley Hill, and Mark Smikowski. Thank you so much for your many years of, uh, as treasurer, and thank you so much. You've been a, a major, major asset, all of you, and thank you so much, Mark. And uh, thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming. I uh, encourage you, as mentioned before, to come to council meetings. Please give us your feedback at any time. Our numbers and uh, emails are listed and uh, placed in the beginning uh, as you leave um, up on the bulletin board. And uh, thank you so much for coming. And uh, if I have a motion to adjourn. Oh. <laughs> Raffles. Ah, the ra Paul, thank you. OK. <laughs> I apologize. Motion to adjourn soon. All right, so you have to be present to win. We have our endangered species duo's chocolate. Do not unwrap, it says. Winner, Terry Kolkowski. Is Terry here? Yay. No? Yes? All right, we have a hand raising in the back. Go ahead. Host defense on the go, Eva Schechtman. <laughs> nice, nicely done. Derma E Vitamin Skin Care. Winner is Brian Carlson. Do we have a Brian here? Oh, over there. There we go. Nice. Oh, go that way. Honest Tea Teas and Tote. Best Betsy Barstow. <laughs> Good Culture Teas and Caps. Susan James. Susan, are you here? Oh, there's Susan. Very good. And the Better Life Green Cleaning Supplies to Katura Huckabee. Doing really well here. Primal Kitchen Hoodies and Goodies, Susan Swanson. Susan, are you here? Oh, there you go. T-shirt grab bag, Walter Liggett. Okay. All right, portable thirst quencher. Rima Carlson. Rima Carlson. All right, good, good. GT's kombucha bundle, Bob Gross. The foodie mix and match, Jessica Clayton. And the wine party to Elizabeth Matai. Oh. All right, nicely done. That was 100% here. Way to stick it into the end, everybody. Okay, one last reminder, um, starting tomorrow is Member Appreciation Weekend at the co-op through Sunday, 5% off for members. We're also featuring a dozen items in our fa fall case lot sale, so lots of savings. And order your turkeys and pies by Monday, November 18th. Scott? Now, do I have a motion to adjourn this 2019 annual meeting? Okay, your name? Susie Swanson, the winner. And a second, Jay. Okay. All those in favor of adjourning the uh, annual meeting this year, please signify saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Have a great evening and uh, get home safe. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>